it's so nice of you to get it up for us. Well, see, the Norwegians in character at last cried Margaret cordially. See here, Lockhart, I'll settle with you for backing her in this scheme, said Phyllis, sitting up and knocking the ashes out of his pipe. She's done crazy things enough on this trip, but to talk of dancing all night with a gang of all Norwegians and taking the carriage at four to catch the six o'clock train out of Riverton, well, it's Tommy Roth, that's what it is. Phyllis, I leave it to your sovereign power of reason to decide whether it is easier to stay up all night than to get up at three in the morning. To get up at three, think what that means. No, sir, I prefer to keep my vigil and then get into a sleeper. But what do you want with the Norwegians? I thought you were tired of dancing. So I am with some people, but I want to see a Norwegian dance, and I intend to. Come, Phyllis, you know how seldom it is that one really wants to do something nowadays. I wonder when I have really wanted to go to a party before. It will be something to remember next month at Newport, when we have to and don't want to. Remember your own theory that contrast is about the only thing that makes life endurable. This is my party and, party and Mr. Lockhart's your whole duty tomorrow night will consist in being nice to the Norwegian girls. I'll warrant you were adept enough at it once, and you'd better be very nice indeed, for it there are many such young Valkyries, as Eric's sister among them. They would simply tie you up in a knot if they suspected you were guying them. But he's groaned and sank back into the hammock to consider his fate, while his sister went on. And the guests, Mr. Lockhart, did they accept? Lockhart took out his knife and began sharpening it on the sole of his plowshoe. Well, I guess we'll have a couple dozen. You see, it's pretty hard to get a crowd together here anymore. Most of them have gone over to do free cosplayers, and they'd rather put their feet in the fire than shake them to a fiddle. Margaret made a gesture of impatience. Those free cosplayers have just cast an evil spell over this country, haven't they? Well, said Lockhart cautiously. I don't just like to pass judgment on any Christian sect. But if you are to know the chosen by their works, the gospelers can't make a very proud showing, and that's a fact. They are responsible for a few suicides, and they have sent a good-sized delegation to the state in St. Anselm. And I don't see, as they have made the rest of us much better than we were before. I had a little hurt boy last spring as square as little Dane, as I want to work for me. But after cosplayers got hold of him and sanctified him, the little beggar used to get down on his knees out on the prairie and pray by the hour, and let the cattle get into the corn, and I had to fire him. That's about the way it goes. Now there is Eric, that chap used to be a hustler and the surprise dancer in all of this section called all the dances. Now he's got no ambition and he's glum as a preacher. I don't suppose we can even get him to come in tomorrow night. Eric. Why he must dance, we can't let him off, said Margaret quickly. Why I intend to dance with him myself. I'm afraid he won't dance. I asked him this morning if he'd help us out, and he said I don't dance any more. Said Lockhart, imitating the labored English of the Norwegian. The miller of Hofbau, the miller of Hofbau, all my princess chirped with his cheerfully from his hammock. The red on his sister cheek deepened a little, and she laughed mischievously. We'll see about that, sir. I'll not admit that I am beaten until I have asked him myself. Every night, Eric rode to, over to St. Anne, a little village in the heart of the French settlement for the mail. As the road lay through the most attractive part of the divided country, on several occasions, Margaret Elliot and her brother had accompanied him. Tonight, Willis had business with Lockhart, and Margaret rode with Eric. 
Arctic night and his mother, seized by a felon daughter of seafaring life, had all followed her brother to America. Eric was 18 when handsome as young Siegfried, giant in stature with a skin singularly pure and delicate like sweets, hair as yellow as the locks of the Nins and amorous prince, and eyes of a fierce burning blue, whose flesh was most dangerous to women. He had in those days a certain pride of bearing, a certain confidence of approach that he should accompany his physical perfection. It was even said of him that when he was in love with life and inclined to love it, defies most unusual on the divide. But the sad history of those Norwegian exiles transplanted in an arid soil, and under a scorching sun had repeated itself in his case. Toil and isolation had sobered him, and he grew more and more like the clods among which he labored. It was as though some red hot instrument had touched for a moment those delicate fibers of the brain which respond to acute pain or pleasure in which lies the power of exquisite sensation, and had seared them quite away. It is a painful thing to watch the light die out of the eyes of those Norsemen, leaving an expression of impenetrable sadness, quite passive, quite hopeless, a shadow that is never lifted. With some, this change comes almost at once. In this first bitterness of homesickness with others, it comes more slowly, according to the time it takes each man's heart to die. Oh, those poor Northmen of the Divide, they are dead many a year before they are put to rest in the little graveyard on the windy hill where exiles of all nations grow akin. The peculiar species of hypochondria to which the exiles of his people sooner or later succumb had not developed in Eric until that night at the Lone Star's coast when he had broken his violin across his knee. After that the gloom of his people settled down upon him and the gospel of maceration began its work. If thine eye often thee pluck it out, etc. The pagan smile that once hovered about his lips was gone, and he was worn with sorrow. Religion heals a hundred yards for one that it embitters, but when it destroys, it works quick and deadly, and where the agony of the cross had been, joy will not come again. This man understood things literally. One must live without pleasure to die without fear. To save the soul, it was necessary to starve the soul. The sun hung low above the cornfields when Margaret and her cavalier left San Anne. South of the town there is a stretch of road that runs for some three miles through the French settlement, where the prairie is as level as the surface of a lake. There the fields of flax and wheat and rye are bordered by precise rows of slender, tapering lumbered poplars. It was a yellow world that Margaret Elliot saw under the white light of the setting sun. Girl gathered up her reins and called back to Eric. It will be safe to run the horses here, won't it? Yes, I think so now, he answered, touching his spur to his pony flank. They were off like the wind. It is an old saying in the West that newcomers always ride a horse or two to death before they get broken into the country. They are tempted by the great open spaces and try to outride the horizon to get to the end of something. Margaret galloped over the level road, and Eric from behind saw her long veil fluttering in the wind. It had fluttered just so in his dreams last night and the night before. With a sudden inspiration of courage, he overtook her and rode beside her, looking intently at her half-averted face. Before he had only stolen occasional glances at it, seen it in blinding flashes, always with more or less embarrassment, but now he determined to let every line of it sink into his memory. Men of the usual world would have said it was an unusual face, nervous, finely cut with clear, elegant lines that betokened ancestry. Men of letters would have called it a historic face and would have conjectured at what old passions, long asleep that old sorrows forgotten in time out of mind, doing battle together in ages gone at 
you said.
Yes, I danced. I danced all the time. The minister's shoulders drooped and an expression of profound discouragement settled over his draggled face. There was almost anguish in the yearning glare he left. Fell for his soul. Eric, I didn't look for this from you. I thought God had sent this mark on you if he had ever on any man. And it is for his things like this that you set your soul back a thousand years from God. Oh, foolish and perverse generation. 